get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, Mark Devine from SealFit, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 creates, we create 100% outsourced VIP special events or mini conferences for software companies or conference organizers. Um, We basically bring together their highest level uh, customers to help them connect and collaborate um, so that they can get their business to the next level. And what it does is it helps them get more referrals, increase retention with their highest level customers and get more engaged new customers. We do them all over the country. We just did them in one in Chicago. We've done them the past year or two in Austin. We did a barbecue tour. You appreciate that, Mike. Um, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Las Vegas, and many more. So if your company sees the value of bringing your highest level customers together to connect and collaborate, go to rise25.com and email us and we'll see if your community qualifies. Um, And I want to give a big thank you to Kaivin Dave, founder of Glider.io, for introducing me to today's guest. I'm very excited. We have Mike McKim, co-founder of QV Coffee. Uh, QV Coffee uh, Roasting Company has provided independent coffee houses and coffee enthusiasts with sustainable artisan blends, single origin, and estate coffees. And I couldn't believe this, Mike, because you look really young, since 1998. It seems like forever ago. Uh, he also is a board chairman at the nonprofit Operation Supply Drop that supports today's active duty military and their families. Uh, Cuvée is a nationally recognized specialty coffee roaster with its roots firmly established in Texas. And Cuvée Coffee and their cold brew can be found at cuveecoffee.com. It can also be found at Whole Foods, HEB, Central Market, Target, and soon to be limited Safeways. Mike, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, thanks for having me. I wanted to start off, you sat at a round table at Bunker Labs. Okay. What's Bunker Labs, first of all? Bunker Labs is um, a nationwide organization that is um, for veteran entrepreneurs. It's basically kind of their pillars are um, education, community, networking and connection. Um, So you've got veteran entrepreneurs from all walks of life who are in various stages from, you know, startup to uh, growth stages, um, all kinds of businesses. I'm the only coffee guy that I know of involved. Was it uh, like a local thing or was it, where was it held when you went to that round table? The round table, I work with Bunker Labs Austin. Okay. So they're Austin chapter. I think they have chapters in 20 plus cities. Got it. So what happened at the round table? (laughs) That was, that was a really cool experience for me. Um, I got invited and Jonathan, one of the founders of Bunker Labs said, Hey, make sure you bring some cold brew. No problem. I get there. The guest who comes into the conference room uh, is Howard Schultz. So people don't know who Howard Schultz is. Yeah. The founder and uh, soon to be ex CEO of Starbucks. Yeah. He didn't Um, tell you this ahead of time. He just told you bring cold brew. Just bring cold brew. Yep. Uh, so that was super exciting because when when I first got into coffee, the first coffee business book that I ever read was his book "Pour Your Heart Into It." Yeah, um, yeah, it was kind of a bummer too because I looked for that book. I wanted to take it and have him autograph it. Unfortunately, I have a bad habit of loaning books out that I really yeah. like, and uh, I usually don't get them back. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it was it was really cool. It was uh, it was a humbling experience. Um, we basically went around the table and, you know, we had like 30, 60 seconds to give our previous military experience and what we're doing now. Right. When it came to me, you know, I give my military background and then say, I own a little coffee company here in Austin. He says, Oh, what's it called? I said, Cuvee coffee. 
He says, you uh, you have that nitro cold brew, don't you? Wow. I was like, well, yes, sir, I do. He said, did you bring any? I said, well, yes, sir, I did. And so I got to, I got a great picture of him chugging one of I my saw cold it. brews. Yeah. It was a, it he was liked a real, it. He liked it, man. He really genuinely liked it. Yeah. That is pretty cool. Now, what I thought was interesting, Mike, about um, researching this is the way you introduced yourself around the table. You said, I, oh. I joined the Navy out of high school and served during the Gulf War. Then I failed out of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. Yep. What, why did you introduce yourself like that? Um, I think it's really important um, you know, to acknowledge and embrace you know, genuine failures, totally. right? And, and uh, it's just part of who I am. And especially when I'm talking with a lot of other entrepreneurs, uh, I, it's kind of a critical part of my story because I like to let people know that I'm nothing special. I'm not particularly intelligent. Um, like, I don't have a lot of business training. Um, there are just certain things that I've done in my life that have helped me get, you know, to the point that I am now. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, failing out of college was one of them. <laughs> what is it that that separates you? You think, if you said, um, I think the common theme as I think back on uh, you know my story and as I relay my story to other entrepreneurs is um, I am I'm relentlessly persistent. Yeah. So um, an example of that is I was. You know, terrible high school student, but for some reason I decided, you know, um, I'm gonna join the military, straighten myself out, join the Navy, and then I got this goal. I said, you know what, I want to go to the Naval Academy, and so I spent the next four years busting my tail, trying to apply for the Naval Academy. Um, literally, the admissions chief that I was talking to, no matter where I was in the world, I was calling him once a week. For four years in a row, calling him once a week. Hey, Master Chief, Petty Officer McKim here. Just want you to know, I took this college course over here in Japan. Uh, you know, I'm sending it in, and and just, just wore this guy out. <laughs> and then what happened was, I was about to age out, and I guess there's a committee of of um, admin folks at all the different federal service academies. He said, Look, man, we don't have a spot for him. In Annapolis, does anybody have a spot for this kid? He's right. about to age. And somebody at the Merchant Marine Academy said, yeah, we, we got a spot. We'll put him on the wait list. If somebody turns down their appointment, he's in. And uh, like, you know, five days later, I was being discharged from the Navy and reporting to uh, Kings Point, New York for school and get my head shaved again and going through boot camp all over. Um, but yeah, it was that persistent. It yeah. was that persistence. Where do you think you get that from? <laughs> I don't know, man. It's a really good question. Um, I, I don't know the answer yeah. to that. And I I can't think back to hmm. my childhood. I don't remember What did your being, parents do? My dad was a pilot. Hmm. Uh, and my mom was worked at a children's hospital. She yeah. was a um, director of neurology and hmm. sleep disorder there. Like, how do you teach persistence? Right. I mean, it's almost ingrained. It seems ingrained in you in a sense. I, I would agree. I, I think I think where it comes from for me is um, I don't like not having an answer. Yeah. Like to me, it's not acceptable. Even if the answer is no, I just want the answer. I right. don't want things left open ended. Hmm. Um, so what was it like serving in the Gulf War? Um. You know what? I always tell people the joining the Navy was absolutely the best thing that I ever did. Um, I was kind of heading down the wrong path, hanging out with the wrong people, had a problem with authority. Um, and so it really, it just gave me, uh, it, it allowed me to become part of something great instead of being part of, you know, um, a bunch of not great stuff. Yeah. So um, it was, yeah, it was uh, it was a, it was an amazing experience. I, I you know spent a lot of time with some great people. Um, 
and it's really funny through the through the magic of social media. Uh, I just had somebody post something on uh, I don't know if it's Instagram or Facebook, and it was a picture of me and uh, three other dudes that were in our squadron. Uh, you know, a picture, a photo from 30 years ago, and wow. I was like, "Wow, this is crazy!" Yeah, that's cool to see. Yeah. What do you remember from your experience there um, that you bring into your your business? Um, I think I think leadership is probably one of them. So I um, do not consider myself a natural leader. But the fact that I got to um, work for some really great leaders and some really poor leaders, I think I learned um, my own style of leadership or yeah. what would work for me. What's your and style? Then, what do you consider your style? Um, uh, leading by example. I mean, it's, it's for me probably the number one thing. There, uh, Everybody that I work with, probably knows that there is not a single task that I would ask them to do that I wouldn't gladly do myself. Right. So whether it's doing dishes or scrubbing a toilet or, you know, hauling coffee sacks, um, I mean, I'm out there with the, with the team right. doing what it takes. So Mike, what did you learn from Joe Monahan? <laughs> so much. Uh, that was another, there's a great persistent story there too. So when I, got out of the Navy and transitioned back into civilian life. Um, uh, like a lot of vets had a, had a difficult transition and did yeah. all sorts of odd jobs from delivering pizzas to uh, telemarketing, right? And then I got introduced to this coffee thing and I decided I wanted to, to build a coffee roasting business. Well, unfortunately, I was about 10 years ahead of the curve here in Texas. So I was fantastically unsuccessful at it. Um, I went 10 months without a single paycheck, right? Mm. Trying to, I was pounding the pavement in Houston, trying to get people to buy coffee from me. Um, what was your pitch at the time? Do you remember? Taste, yeah, taste my coffee. I would go into any restaurant, coffee shop, anything. I would say, taste the coffee. And we would taste coffees and they'd be like, yeah, your coffee's better, but it's 50 cents a pound more. So I can't buy it. Um, yeah, it was a challenge. And I remember my wife says to me one night, she says, hey, um, after I put Connor to bed, you know, we need to talk. So we had we had a, our oldest son. Nothing that point. good follows that typically. Nothing good follows. Yeah. So she proceeded to sit down, look me in the eye and say, uh, so we have enough money to pay bills one more month and then we're totally broke. I was like, wow. OK, makes sense. Ten months without a paycheck. That's I guess what happens. Um. On one of my sales calls, I met a person who wanted to buy an espresso machine. I told them I can 100% get that machine for you, which I had no idea if I could or not. That's where Joe Monahan entered. I call him. I say, hey, Joe, this is Mike, you know, Cuve down in Texas. Remember me? He's like, yeah, sure, I remember you. By the way, we're hiring a regional manager based in Atlanta, so you won't call me anymore. You'll call her, and, you know, that's who you buy espresso machines from. And I said, uh have you hired her yet? He said, no. Why? I said, I'll take the job. He said, what do you mean? I said, I haven't had a paycheck in 10 months, man. I'm broke. I'll take the job. I don't care what it pays. He's like, uh, okay, whatever. Every morning I called him first thing in the morning. Hey Joe, it's Mike. I'm ready to start whenever you're, you know, whenever you need me, I'm ready. Um, and finally I, I just was, I wore him down and they ended up hiring me and I spent five years selling espresso machines for him mm. and to answer your question what I learned from him was uh, I call it my coffee MBA that five years I learned everything from him about coffee about espresso about sales about customer service I mean he he is the most he's the most likable salesperson I've ever met in my life like he has a way of asking you a very direct, uncomfortable question, but making it comfortable hmm. it is the guy's just a genius, man. And I learned a ton. How does he do? Like, can you give me an example? I have a problem just, a asking uncomfortable questions. Yeah, it's just like. Um, you remember I mean, something the, he actually said to someone that 
Like I can't believe he just asked that, but he made it seem so effortless. Yes, I have a perfect one. Um, yeah. So one time, uh, we had a, we had a couple different espresso machines, right? And there's a traditional machine, which is very hands-on, and then there's a super automatic, which is you know you push a button and it does everything for you. So I'm in a sales call with Joe, and this guy, he says to Joe, I just need a machine that's idiot-proof. And Joe says to him, I won't even be able to say it in, in the nice way that he did. He said, well, why? Do you hire idiots? <laughs> and, like, he did it and didn't offend the guy. Like, it was so, uh, it was so amazing. I just couldn't, I, I couldn't even wrap my head around it. That he, but that's a perfect example. He could ask a very pointed question like that and and not piss somebody off. How did you meet Joe originally? Uh, my uncle, Carl, owns a company called Agtron uh, out in Nevada. They make food analyzation equipment. Uh, one of the things is a coffee degree of roast analyzer, and he's the guy that Carl introduced me to coffee. And just you know, as I was getting into coffee, Carl knew everyone and started introducing me to different people and Joe was just one of them I met at a trade show. So Mike, tell me about the, the transition. So you're selling the espresso machines. Yep. So what's the point when you realize, okay, I need to, to break out on my own? Um, it's really funny because every year, like around November, I would go through this same rant and I would tell my wife, I'm just going to be, I'm, you know, I'm going to quit my job and do this coffee thing full time. And she's like, yeah, it didn't work out so great the first time. You know, I was still good, roasting coffee. Good confidence booster there. Yeah. <laughs> still roasting Thanks coffee. Thanks for the pep talk. Yeah. <laughs> I was still roasting coffee in my garage. Um, and then at some point, um, my wife, Rochelle, jumped in and started taking over all the finances because I was terrible at it anyway. Bills wouldn't get paid. Um, I'm, I've learned I'm fiscally irresponsible. Um, and I, it was, I prefer more visionary, less operations. Okay, perfect. Yes, okay. Take it. Um, in 2006, I, you know, it's my November rant and I'm like, I'm just, you know, do this coffee thing and all. And she looks at me and she says, you know what? I've been going over all the books and I think you should quit your job. Mm. I was like, wow, all right. And so that was it, man. Uh, December 31st, 2006, I declared myself unemployable. So you were roasting coffee in your garage. Yes. So what, what, what did that look like up until you decided to, to quit? your full-time job yeah 2006 um it it was basically the coffee thing was a weekend thing for me and then it kind of turned into a, a weekend and night thing and then in 2006 um the coffee roasting had grown my espresso machine sales had grown and i wasn't really doing either job as well as I, I thought I could, yeah. and I just I had to make a decision one way or the other. Mm. So where were you selling it? Coffee? Yeah, the coffee, yeah. Uh, the You know, it's funny. We, uh, we were in Houston at the time. That's where we lived, and uh, pretty much all of our sales were here in Austin, hmm. which is one of the reasons that we relocated the company here 11 years ago. And so you were just in the evenings and weekends cold calling places and going into places or? Yeah, it was, it was, it was really interesting because, um, at that time there weren't a lot of coffee roasters in Texas. And then to go a little bit deeper on that, there weren't a lot of, you know, what they call specialty coffee roasters in Texas. So the, the trend for specialty coffee shops was starting to rise, the internet was available. So when people got online and did research, you know, for coffee roaster in Texas, we just always popped up because there wasn't really any competition. Yeah. Um, so Mike, you leave and that's a tough decision, right? Not just financially, but you're working with your mentor. Yes. Right. So how did that discussion go? Uh, you know what, it, w it was as, as everything is with Joe, it was a very comfortable conversation, and um, man, he was happy. He was super happy. Yeah. Um, so, favorite products? What are some of the most popular products? 
Um, for whole bean coffee, I would say our, our house espresso blend, you know, so home enthusiasts who have espresso machines in their home, we sell a lot of our espresso blend. Uh, and then cold brew. I mean, cold brew is, especially now with the weather um, heating up here in Texas um, and the popularity of cold brew in the beverage category, it's by far um, our most popular product. So when did you decide to start to experiment and introduce cold brew to, to your line? Um, I, funny story, it was, uh, so after I quit my job, after I left with Joe, the one thing that they did do is they kept me um, as a consultant to work with other salespeople in different parts of the country for 2007. So I did a little bit of work with them. Uh, and it was nice because it gave me a little bit of a, a cushion financially. Yeah. Makes it a little easier transition probably. Yes. Yes. Very much so. I went to, um, I think I was in Sedona with one of the sales guys and uh, we're at a coffee shop. And there's all these high school age kids coming up to the counter, ordering a drink, and he pours the drink out of a beer tap, hands them the drink. And then off they go. I watch this over and over and over. And finally, I asked the guy, I'm like, what the heck are you serving these kids? Because, you know, I assumed a beer tap. It was some sort of beer alcohol drink. He takes me in the back. He goes, man, let me show you what I'm doing. He's brewing coffee, hot, dumping it into a homebrew keg, adding milk and vanilla syrup, and then putting it on tap and serving it. Hmm. And I was like, this is genius. I come back, all of our wholesale customers in Texas, I tell them the same thing. The cold brew that you're making, put it on tap and people lose their mind. And every single person told me that was the dumbest thing that they've ever heard. Mm. So that was in 2007. Um, and then I, I just, honestly, I, I couldn't shake the idea of you know cold brew on tap. And uh, I think the catalyst that rekindled my desire to chase down cold brew stuff was I read an article that said 85% of the tea that's consumed in the U S is consumed over ice. Mm. And I thought, okay, this, you know, why does tea get all the love coffee? Coffee has a place. Um, so I started working on cold brew and, uh, a formulation and a recipe and then got introduced to the whole nitro thing via, um, left hand nitro milk stout beer and I was like this is what we need to do with coffee we need to make it nitro this is cool um, so then I went down that rabbit hole and, and in 2011 launched nitro cold brew and kegs how hard was that process it seems like it'd be quite a uh, undertaking it's you know what it, it the um, the it's not difficult to do um, but it's difficult to do well and consistent hmm. uh, um, you know so at the beginning it was sketchy you know some was super nitro some was you know minimal amount of nitro um, but now yeah the stuff that we do now we built a new facility moved in earlier this year um, and you know we use all the all the latest technology so that we can be consistently great and consistently consistent. So when did you you're doing kegs of it and but you guys do cans too? Yes. So the end game was to always do cans. Um, the problem was uh, nitro beers in general always have this thing called a widget in them, right? And a widget is just a little device that discharges nitrogen gas creates turbulence and, yeah and so we were having a hard time canning the product and getting an acceptable nitro effect of course the only person that had a widget was guinness and they didn't license it to anyone yeah guinness. that's what i think of when you say that yeah, yeah. and uh I, I was about to give up on that dream of you know you give up the, come on <laughs> nitro coffee in a can and then I read this press release. Oscar Blues uh, uses new widget can technology to can their Old Chub Nitro beer. 
Hmm. So I get on the phone, call Oscar Blues, and I'm like, hey, can I learn about this? And they're like, sure, come on out, can beer with us for a couple days. Hmm. Um, so I did that, and then fortunately the Ball Corporation who makes the widget cans is in Colorado as well. So I went back with product, did a bunch of lab testing with them in their new widget cans, and then uh, 2014, we're the first people in the world to launch nitro cold brew in a can. Wow. Yeah. Um, I want to hear your thought process, too, on the ingredients, right? Like when you, those people um, had it on tap, they were mixing it with other things. And yours, I believe, is just black. There's no sugar or anything in it. Yes. Is so the there a first, reason? The first product we rolled out um, is, yeah, it's just the nitro black coffee. So it's coffee, water, and nitrogen. That's it. Um, yeah, and the reason is because that's, that's what I drink, right? Um, I kind of made the product for myself, like a lot of the products that we do here. Um, and then, you know, there, we were also, you know, first to market with that product. So we really just didn't know, we didn't know what the consumer was going to like, wasn't going to like. Um, so black coffee is what we launched with first. Now, you know, you go into the grocery store and there's a gazillion cold brews. But everybody's got vanilla and chocolate and salted caramel and all that. And I'm like, you know what? That's not the path I want to take. I want to go a different direction. So um, I'm a big uh, proponent of uh, cannabidiol, CBD. And so we launched one with hemp oil, right? So it's got 10 milligrams. Every can has 10 milligrams of CBD hemp in it. Uh, Once again, it's a product that I take. And so I made that product for myself. not knowing that CBD is one of the hottest things in the fitness industry. Right. Um, so athletes have just gravitated towards that. Um, and then, of course, all the pro, you know, all the pro hemp and pro marijuana people gravitate towards it, too, just yeah. because. Um, and then the product that we're doing our first production run next week is uh, horchata, huh. which is another one that's just you don't see it on the shelf. But um, at our coffee bar, we do lots of different concoctions, and we've been doing it's your testing ground. It's, yeah, it's our test kitchen, 100%. We've been doing horchata cold brew for a few years, and every time it's on the menu, it's our number one selling drink. Wow! So that just seemed like you know low hanging fruit. So the cold brew nitro hemp oil coffee. What yep. are some of the misconceptions that you hear about? this product or hemp oil in general because there's a lot of different you know um thoughts and some are accurate and some are not yep so the the challenge the challenge that we face not being um a state where marijuana is legal recreational marijuana is legal is cbd can be made from marijuana or hemp right when it's made from marijuana it contains thc which is psychoactive right when it's made from hemp, it contains trace amounts of THC and it's non psychoactive. Right. So this is this is the main reason that we call it hemp oil on the can instead of CBD, because we have to make sure that people understand yeah. it's hemp. Even though technically it's CBD, it's just made from a hemp plant. It's made right? from yes, it's made from so, cannabis or hemp. So to avoid to people avoid like gray areas by not calling it CBD, even though technically it is CBD, it just comes from, you know, people don't differentiate between marijuana and hemp. They just associate CBD with marijuana, which is maybe a gray area for states that are not legal. Is that? Exactly. Because I don't remember seeing uh, products, you could tell me, um, that say CBD, it doesn't really specify, at least on the cover of it, if it's from hemp or marijuana. Are they required to just disclose, okay, the CBD is from hemp or marijuana, or do people just say, throw CBD around because it's not, it's, it's newer? I don't know. I think um, what I've experienced is, you know, you go to a place like Colorado where marijuana, recreational marijuana is legal. CBD, it doesn't matter what it's made from right. because it's legal, right? Um, well, it just will have different amounts of THC, though, right? 
It will have yeah, it will have THC in it exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that is the biggest misconception is people people don't realize that hemp and marijuana are two totally different things. Hemp is an agricultural product, marijuana is psychoactive. Right? Um, so to answer your question, that's probably the biggest challenge. Yeah. Um I want, you know, Mike, what's interesting is you've set up a lot of like not just local relationships in Texas, but a lot of global relationships. I want if you could just talk a little bit about that, you know, because you're doing a lot with just actual people, f- you know, harvesting the the coffee, right? Yes. Yeah, I was really fortunate. So the um, I tend to listen to people that I uh, people that I respect when they give me advice. I tend to listen to them. Uh, and one of the things my uncle said when he got into the business, when I got into the business, was whatever you do, pay higher prices for higher quality coffee, raw coffee, raw product, uh, and people will notice a difference. And he was 100% right. So I just kind of followed that mentality. Our coffee was always more expensive than everyone else's because we were paying higher prices. Um, and then I was really fortunate to be in those years that I worked for Joe Monahan. Uh, he plugged all of our salespeople. He plugged us into the Specialty Coffee Association of America, um, or used to be the SCAA. Now it's just the Specialty Coffee Association. But um, it, that was, um, I mean, that was just that was at the time when um, there was a group of coffee roasters who were pioneering a trend called direct trade. Right. And direct trade was the idea of, you know, going and working directly with farmers and paying, you know, higher than fair trade wages and making sure they're good stewards of the land and all that sort of stuff. Since I was selling espresso machines to all these guys, kind of by default, I went along for that ride with them. And since I was a coffee roaster also, I was interested in that. Um, so I was an early adopter of that direct trade um, model and got to learn from some of the smartest coffee people who were developing that model. Um, and that was in 2000 and like two maybe. Uh, and I took my first trip to a coffee growing country um, and expected to get there and just let a farmer know how thankful I was for the work they were doing and all that. and and quickly realized that they were thankful that I was buying coffee from them and mm. the other people that we were with were buying coffee from them, like very thankful. Right. Uh, and that's when I realized, wow, like we can, we can really make an impact on not just one farmer or one family, but you know, as we grow really a whole community. And so that becomes powerful. Yeah. What did you learn about visiting them about how they live? I'm sure it opens your eyes to different things, I imagine. It does. Um, I think the, th- the, thing, the thing that I learned um, really quickly was not to compare anyone's living conditions to our living conditions here in the U.S., right? It's easy to go into somebody's, you know, home and they have dirt floors and go, oh my God, these poor people, they have dirt floors. Well, what's wrong with a dirt floor? There's nothing wrong with a dirt floor, you know? Um, Judging so them yeah. off of our own, uh, our own maybe experiences or standards of how we would live? A hundred percent. Yep. Hmm. Yep. What were yeah, other differences? Funny. What were some noticeable differences that you saw that maybe in the beginning were a little bit shocking, but afterwards it just becomes you know, how they live. Like you mentioned the dirt floors. Are there any other examples like that that may surprise people? Um, well, yeah, I mean, depending on the country. Look, you go somewhere like Costa Rica, it's it's kind of like being in Southern California or something. It's, you know, it's that place is, infrastructure's great. It's easy to travel in. But go somewhere like Ethiopia. Um, and, I mean, it, this is... This is probably not a a, um, a great story, but 
I'm actually in literally in a government office in Ethiopia and I've got to use the restroom. And so somebody takes me down the hallway to the restroom and then comes in with a bucket and a rag because they don't use toilet paper. Hmm. And this is in a government office, right? And and so you're expected to do your business, you know, with your hands and then wash your hands in this bucket of water. So that's um that was really eye opening. <laughs> totally. Um <laughs> Yeah, I think my in-laws went on a trip and they were telling our family and my kids specifically that they had to, you know, go to the bathroom in a hole. And then my kids proceeded to say, I'm never going there. (laughs) They just associate that place with going to the bathroom in a hole and then they've warded off. But um, your wife has been really influential in the business. Yes. What's her role? She's CFO. Okay. So anything that has to do with finance. Um, and then she's also, I mean, she's the reason you know, everything, part of the identity of the company, part of the identity of the company is the color blue. Right, so everything yeah. we do is blue. And she was the reason for that. Hmm. Why? Um, she, she said, look, if you go into the grocery store and you walk down the coffee aisle, Every single bag looks the same. It's either plain brown or some sort of earth tone. She said, "We, you know, we need to do something totally different. So let's do blue bags." And I was like, "Blue? That's dumb. We should do earth tones because that's what everybody else does." And she was like, "Nope, we're doing blue." And I was like, yeah. "All right, I guess we're doing blue." It's a different type of blue, though. Also, yeah. In addition, I, I agree. Know. Yeah, it's funny. Our uh, our bag manufacturer he came to visit. I don't know, a couple years ago, and uh, he sat down in the office and proceeded to let us all know that we would be amazed how many people call them and ask for Cuvée Blue. Oh, wow. On the packaging, yeah. It's a new color. It's a, it's a thing. <laughs> um, how do you decide to release or um, come up with a new product? Because I imagine the ones you have keep you quite busy. Yeah, I, um, it's funny, I, I I am notorious for, I constantly think about what's next, like I can't stop thinking about what's next, which is a blessing and a curse. Um, The downside of it is, is I'll come up with an idea, I'll start a project, I'll get about 70% into it, and then I'll be bored with that project because I'm thinking about the next idea. Right. So yeah, I, I pretty much never stop thinking about what's next. So who puts the slap down on you not going forward with something? Is there someone you have to run it by to say, hey, uh, no? No. No, I just, I mean, I, uh, once again, you know, people that I respect, I definitely ask advice and 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 listen to what they tell me. So there's usually, you know, there's a few people, if I'm unsure about an idea, there's a few people that I'll run it by, um, you know, and just ask them to punch holes in it and know that it's not personal if they tell me it's dumb um, or it won't work or the or just that the reasons that they don't think it'll work. Um, I actually like that type of challenge. So it sounds like, like early on the team is you and your wife in a garage. So... <laughs> Who do you hire first when you start to, okay, now you go, I'm going at this full time. I'm going to make this work. Who do you bring on? Or what type uh, of positions? The first guy I hired was named Dan. Um, and I hired him to do sales. Because um, I was doing all the roasting. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was hire number one. And then the second guy that I hired was um, a roaster to help with roasting. And what's been a key position in the company that maybe was surprising? That maybe you thought, yeah, this is a necessity, but actually helped move the ball forward? Um, Well, uh, obviously finance. I mean, if, if I didn't have somebody competent doing that, if I was doing it, this would be a disaster over here. The other one is, um, 
I'm, you know, going back to, I think we talked a little bit about this. I'm not a very good operations person. Um, so having, I've got a, a director of production operations um, and a guy named Logan and he is just, um, he runs a tight ship and all, all the stuff that um, I wouldn't do very well, he does very well. Mm. So that's definitely, in order for us to scale this business, that's a role that I had to step out of and put somebody good in there. What does the evolution of the facilities look like? Again, garage. What's next after that? Yeah, uh, crappy little two thousand square foot warehouse in a strip center. Okay. In Houston, Texas. Um, then the place that we're in here now. Um, we built this building. It's four thousand square feet where we do all of our coffee roasting and we carved out a small corner, like maybe a couple hundred square feet where we were doing cold brew in the corner of the roasting facility. And now the new uh, cold brew facility that we just opened up is 11,000 square feet. And Huge. All, yeah, all we do there is cold brew. Where do you have your sights set on? Who else should be carrying this that isn't yet? Um, well, right now, I think uh, we've always just focused in Texas, right? Never really sought business outside of the state. And a lot of that was kind of by design. You know, this the business really has been a lifestyle business for Rochelle and I for a long time. And, you know, a couple years ago, as cold brew was starting to take off, we just had the conversation, look, we can, we can keep doing what we're doing and it's a good lifestyle business or man, we can dive in head first and see if we can blow this up. And we obviously chose the latter. So um, the plan is to get product outside of Texas more. I think we've done a great job here, but there's a lot of country outside of Texas that's uncovered right now. Totally. Um, what's been some of the big challenges? Um, I think... There's a couple things. One, um, we've never taken a loan or anything like that. We've always grown the business with working capital, which is good and it's sustainable. And we've always been worried about profitability and all that sort of stuff. Um, the challenge is that that's slow growth usually. Um, so now, you know, I, I think one of the challenges is gut checking ourselves and dumping the amount of money into you know the new facility and hiring you know more employees and all that sort of stuff you know knowing that we're going to burn cash for a little while before um you know the sales catch up to all the infrastructure that we've built yeah totally so that's um, a people always love to hear different tools or software people use to run their business um, what are some things you use on a daily or weekly basis? Um, I was just looking at the website. I don't know what type of platform you use. What are some of the things you, you use to run the business? Well, the, the website, um, thank goodness Kyvin is in charge of that. So okay. he's doing total digital overhaul for us. Um, we actually sell a lot of coffee online on our website, even though it's a crappy website and it's not intuitive and the shopping cart kind of sucks. And so we're redoing that, um, which I think we can increase revenue tenfold online just just with somebody smart handling that. Um, man, I'm sorry. What was the original um, question? Are there any tools or software oh, you use? Yeah. 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 Um, so for the, the coffee bar, we use Slack for communication, yeah. um, which is a great tool because it you know, pops Slack. up on my phone when somebody sends me a message. Um, and then here on this side of the house, um, we use a really cool cloud-based platform called um, Cropster. Hmm. And Cropster is a, um, a software that allows us to track our green coffee inventory. It allows us to keep track of all of our roast profiles, and then we can take those coffees, bring them into the lab, taste them, put all our tasting notes in, and that way everything hmm. synced together. That's cool. Um, yeah. So from a consistency and quality control standpoint, that tool is massive. Hmm. 
Love it. Really like that program. Um, I always ask, Mike, first of all, thank you for doing this. Um, I know you have a million things going on. And it's it's really valuable to hear your, your lessons and stories. Um, I just, I always ask since it's Inspired Insider, what's been the lowest moment? And then on the flip side, what's been a really proud uh, moment? What's been a low moment that you had to push through? Um, my lowest moment, and it's such an easy question, um, and it's a story that just, uh, I hate it every time it comes up, but my lowest moment was, I was, uh, you know, basically in between, it was after I quit uh, um, college at Kings Point, uh, or left, failed out, whatever, um, man, I had no idea what I was going to do. A, I felt like such a loser, you know, for, 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 um, not being able to push through that. And then I took a job delivering pizzas and the, the guy that was, uh, the driver on shift the same time I was, was on medication for audio hallucinations. And I would stand back there and talk to this guy, Kenny and, and, it was just that was a dark time for me, man. Hmm. It just it felt I just felt so bad um, about myself. So that was by far my lowest point. How do you deal with that? Like get out of that funk? Um I mean it know, seems it seems right now, looking back, you know, it seems like right now in this time Oh yeah, I just kind of it, you're in a good place, right? But then you weren't, so it's a it's different story when you're in the situation. Yeah, I think this, and this is something I try and teach my sons, um, is the power of networking. Hmm. Um, and I didn't realize it back then, but just because of people I had met, people that I knew, friends that I had, you know, somebody helped me get a job getting out of the pizza joint and getting into AT&T and doing telemarketing, right? So that was my introduction to sales, which is, you know, that's pretty much what I've done the majority of my adult life now is sales. Um, so I think it, to answer your question, I think it was, uh, it was the network that helped hmm. drag me to that. Um, yeah. and then I'm also just in general, I'm not one to, um, I'm not one to throw myself a pity party. Like maybe I'll let myself feel sorry about something for, you know, a brief moment, but then I'm like, okay, you know, I gotta, I gotta get out of this on my own. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's powerful. The network, you know, if you're in, someone's in a bad place, they could call someone that they trust or that they, you know, could help them pull them, pull them out or maybe slap some sense into them. Um, so what about the proud moment? What's been a proud uh, moment in the journey? Um, man, there's been, now, there's been a lot, you know, I'm always proud when, um, when somebody has worked for us for a while and then they come to me because they got bit by the entrepreneurial bug mm. and they want to go out and start their own business, whether it's a coffee business, coffee shop, a coffee roasting business, you know, or something totally different. I, uh, that always makes me feel proud. Um, man, when we built this 4,000 square foot facility, like, you know, before we did this little, you know, ceremony, me and my wife and the guy that was pouring the slab and, you know, let me put the shovel in the dirt and take the first scoop of dirt out. And I just remember just like, tears streaming out of my face that wow this is actually going to be a thing this is going to happen um i think that was super cool so it was it was created out of nothing there was nothing there before nothing yeah wow. yeah and then um man another one so uh i have two sons one will be a senior in high school this year the other one um he just finished up his first year at the united states merchant marine academy oh, so wow. he made it he made it further than I did already. Um, but the fact that he came home from a high school college fair and said, you know, I think I want to go to Kings Point. Mm. And I was like, what? That's crazy. Uh, 
Um, sorry. It's like phone a friend. We'll bring him on. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so that was another – on a personal note, yeah. that's a super one for me. What sparked that, you think? Was it stories from you? Was it, I mean, it sounds like you were surprised. It's not like you were pushing him to do that. I absolutely wasn't, man. I, I try and uh, – you know, I, I understand and I think a lot of us go through the same thing. The, the one person we listen to least in life as um, young males is usually our father. At some point, we think we know more than them, and whatever they say is right. dumb. You just do the opposite. Um, so I try never to, um, never to force my boys to do anything. Um, I just try and give them advice and let them, let them make their own yeah. decisions. So yeah, when he came home and said, "Hey, I want to go to a federal service academy. I want to go to Kings Point," I was like, "Well, all right, I'll help you any way I can." And Why do you, what was his reasoning? You know, that's a good question. Um, Connor has always he's always wanted to take a different path than his peers. So um, you know, living living here in, in Austin, Texas, when everybody else is playing football or baseball, he was like, I think I want to play ice hockey. It's like ice hockey. What? That's weird. Ooh, it goes with weird. cold brew. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I, I think that he's always wanted to take a different path, and mm. that's probably the reason he went this direction. That's cool, um, Mike. What briefly? What's um, Operation Supply Drop? I know we talked about it in the very beginning. Yeah. Um, what is it? Yeah, Operation Supply Drop is a, a nonprofit that does a couple things. Um, Kind of the meat of the program and the introduction to the Operation Supply Drop program is um, we send care packages to deployed troops. Mm. And those care packages consist of gaming consoles, controllers, and video games. Um, that's how people get introduced to Operation Supply Drop. And then with uh, cool. a lot of partnerships with people like Microsoft and Starbucks and folks like that, um, Google. We have a lot of programs and training uh, and a community built for people when they transition out of the military and back into mm. civilian life. Because, you know, I think everybody understands now that, you know, when you're in a military environment, you have a tribe. When you're on a sports team, you've got a tribe or whatever. And then, you know, when you are, when you're taken out of that tribe, you know, sometimes you can be a little bit rudderless. So, um, yeah, being able to help people as they transition back to civilian life is, that's the second part and yeah. probably the, the most important part of Operation Supply Drop. What helps ease that? It sounds like even for you, it's a really, really difficult transition, I imagine. It's like structured, then you go to something completely a different world essentially yeah I think yes so there is that I mean you know your day is pretty much planned for you so there's not a whole bunch of planning involved um, and then the other part is I, I think I think it's tough because when you spend time in the military everybody kind of thinks and acts similar and then you get out of the military, you, you get into a civilian job, and you're like, man, why don't these people think like everybody else that I used to work with? Well, because, you know, a lot of them weren't in the military, so they don't think. And you go through this struggle, you're like, man, well, if they would just understand, if they would do it the military way, they would. And really, it's like, well, no, you're not in the military anymore. You you need to transition back to civilian life, not try and make civilian life more military-like. I think that's probably one of the biggest mm. uh, hurdles that a lot of people yeah. have to. Yeah. Mike, I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been great. Everyone should check out cuvecoffee.com. It's C-U-V-E-E, -E, coffee.com. Where else should we point people towards online or anywhere else? Well, um, you know, all the social platforms, everything is at Cuve Coffee. So Instagram, Facebook, um, 
Twitter, all that sort of stuff. Cool. All right. And then anybody that wants to connect with me, I'm just at Mike McKim. Great. Thank you, Mike, again. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Everyone Jeremy. check out cuvecoffee.com and yeah. try out their cold brew and their nitro hemp oil cold brew. Perfect. All right. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 